I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 73. On this uh, Thanksgiving weekend, I really just want to go back and talk about how good God is. Um, we open up in this verse, surely God is good. Psalm 73, 1. And then we sang, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. And we, we just have been singing about the goodness of God. But there are times that you look at other people, you look at the world and you think, wow, they have everything. And you're walking with God. You're sacrificing and serving and walking with God. And it, it doesn't seem like things are going well for you at times. There's a little speed bump here and a glitch there. And you look at the world and, it's, and you maybe say some of the same words the psalmist said in Psalm 73. He starts out in verse 1. He's doing really fine. Surely God is good to Israel and to those who are of pure hearts. But then in verse 2, he just gets off on a tangent somehow. And instead of God being good, he says, but as for me, and then he goes off about himself. So let me just uh, read. Uh, it's 28 verses. I'm going to read the first 17 verses with you. And it says this, a psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. And then this kind of conclusion, he says, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Let me take you back to verse 1, and let me highlight, it's a psalm of Asaph. Uh, you might not know much about Asaph. Asaph, uh, David wrote many of the psalms. Moses even wrote a psalm. Others wrote some of the psalms, but Asaph, you might not know who he is, but he was a young uh, musician. And here's what happened. David, who was a consummate uh, musician, played the harp before before Saul to calm him down when he was king. David was always playing an instrument, singing before the Lord. But at some point, you have to be able to practice in order to keep up things. And David became king. And when he was king, he probably didn't keep, uh, you know, when you play a harp, your fingers, especially your fingertips, have to have calluses where you keep playing and playing. At first, when you start playing, they start out as blisters. And, and they, they hurt. And, and some of you have played guitars. And some of you with the guitars, you have plastic strings. And they're a little easier on your hands. And some of you have the metal strings. And those really thin metal wires, when you push down on them with your fingers, it just gets so it hurts. And then till they, uh, until after a while, you're, you got just calluses on the tips of your fingers. 
But David became king, and, and he didn't have time. And so he appointed other musicians to do the ministry. But you'll recall at one point, when they were going to battle one time, that they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Do you remember the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant wasn't really a big uh, ark of some kind. It was only about 39 or 40 inches, uh, about the length uh, of my elbow to elbow. It's just a little bitty thing. And where they had um, the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded, God's presence was in that Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant sat in the, in the Tent of Meeting and in the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. In the Ark of the Covenant. Remember when they carried it? They could only, nobody could touch it. One guy reached up at one point. It was starting to fall and he reached up to touch it and struck dead. God says, here's what you're going to do with it. This is really sacred, really important. But there came a time when they went into battle and they decided that they needed some extra help. So somebody said, you know what we need? You know what would really help us win this battle? Let's go get our good luck charm. And they wanted to treat the Ark of the Covenant like, oh, like a good luck charm, like a rabbit's foot or something. Let's take that into battle, and then we'll win. But they took it into battle, and they lost. Because God said, what are you doing? And they captured the Ark of the Covenant. And then they waited and waited and, and attempted to get it back. When it came back, Boy, they were saying, let's have a celebration. The ark is back. It's returned to the temple. And let's, well, it's returned to the, the tabernacle at that point because Solomon hadn't come in and the temple hadn't been built at that point. But let's, but let's bring it back. Let's have a celebration. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, they talk about that celebration. But to have a celebration, they said they needed some writers like David. They needed some writers like Asaph. So in 1 Chronicles 6, it says this, verse 31. These are the men David put in charge of the music in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest there. They said, let's celebrate. And then they go down through. They ministered with music before the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, with, until Solomon built the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They performed their duties according to the regulations laid down for them. Here are the men who served together with their sons. That's verse 33. Then I jump to verse 39 in the listing. Heman's associate, Asaph, who served at his right hand. Asaph, son of Berechiah. So here's this young guy just learning. Right now, just be my right hand man, Heman said. And you'll be... Uh, eventually learning how to celebrate and do music before the Lord. This is First uh, Chronicles chapter 6. By the time you get to chapter 16, it says this. David appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to make petition, to give thanks, to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief. Back in chapter 6, he was the right-hand man, but not in charge. By the time you get to chapter 16, he's the chief guy over all the music. So when it came time for the worship and the praise, Asaph wrote the songs that they were singing and leading them in music. The text goes on in verse 7. That day, let me highlight it here. That day, David first committed to whom? Asaph. To Asaph and his associates, this, this psalm of thanks to the Lord. So here's Asaph. If anybody ought to know about God's goodness and how to lead people in praise, it ought to be Asaph. If you want somebody up here leading music, you want somebody that understands the goodness of God. You want somebody that loves God. If you want somebody up here that says, oh, I don't believe in God. Oh, I don't know if God's good. If you want somebody up here preaching saying, oh, I'm not sure God's good. After all, you had problems. And if you have problems, you, God must not be good. No, you want somebody that understands it. So here's Asaph. He's the chief when it comes to the music. And he's writing music for the people. And let me give you some of the psalms he wrote. He wrote a dozen psalms. 
the one we want to focus on today is Psalm 73. And in Psalm 73, we read most of it to you. Verse 1, as I said, he starts out just soaring away, wings spread out. Oh, surely God is good to Israel. It's just soaring above, going, wow, isn't God good? But as soon as he gets that out, then he slips into, but, but as for me, now he's writing a song. And the song's going to be about him? But as for me, my foot had almost slipped. I'd lost my foothold. And now it's going to be a, about him. And I'm going, wait a minute. Sounds like some songs that are written today for church. Instead of being about God, it's about, about me, 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 me. About us. When he wrote this psalm, remember, he was the chief musician. He was the guy that was going to lead them in worship. He ought to be able to say to them with confidence, God is good. All the time. And we sang it today. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good. And then we went just right on. People from every nation and tongue. From generation to generation, we worship you. Why? Because you're good. But when this guy got up at this point in his life, it was, ah, uh, you know, I'm not so sure about God being good. After all, I don't understand. God, if you say you're so good, why do bad things happen to good people? And that's what Psalm 73 is all about. He's really saying there, uh, I don't understand. Why is it that godly people struggle? And that's what he deals about in this particular passage. Many people have raised the question as to why the righteous seem to suffer and the wicked go free. Job questioned it and ended by saying this. Oh, surely I, I spoke of things I did not understand. I... Lord, I can't believe what I, some of the things I've faced. I lost my kids. I lost my cattle. I lost my house. But by the end of his life in Psalm 42, by the end, he gets it all back. And he says, surely I, I spoke of things I didn't understand. David was the same way in Psalm 37. And in Psalm 37, David wrote, fret not thyself because of evildoers, because of him who prospers in the way. Why are you fretting because of evildoers? They seem to be doing so good. His conclusion was in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And he said four things. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. And if it's possible, be still before the Lord. Oh, when our kids get out of hand, sometimes we say, yeah, you just, hey, look, you sit here and be be still. And they're fidgeting away. And it's kind of like us as believers. He said, look, can't you sit for a moment and just bask in the goodness of God? But the difficulty is, Satan says, I want them to think that God isn't good. I want them to think that, see, we have this equation in our mind. Goodness, God's goodness equals no struggles. And God never said God's goodness equals no struggles. As a matter of fact, God's goodness, and then instead of the equal sign, you put the two straight lines and then a line through it. Because God's goodness does not equal no struggles. He said he permits struggles in our lives so that we trust him more and so that we can be moved to maturity. But for the psalmist, the chief musician here, he's saying, I don't know whether God is really that good. So how can we avoid the conflict that Asaph experienced? I mean, he was a spiritual leader. Why can't he trust God and praise God for his goodness even in the midst of struggles? How can we avoid it? Well, by not making the, the same mistakes that he made. And... Uh, what are some of those mistakes that he reveals in Psalm 73? Well, in verses uh, 
22 through, oh, let's say 21, 22, he talks about all his problems, all the mistakes he made. He actually gives us three mistakes. Let me give them to you right here in the text. First, he started by envying what the wicked had. And you say, well, I don't envy. Envy and coveting are very close. Envy, um, say, if you say, wow, that's a really, that's a great car. And you envy somebody else that has it. Now let me tell you the difference between envy and, and just saying, that's a nice car. Boy, I'd like to have a car like that. The difference is when you reach the point in your life where someone says, I wish I had a car like that. Matter of fact, I wish you didn't have it. I wish I had it. When you wish they didn't have it. Let me use it this way in the Ten Commandments when he says, thou shalt not covet. What does he say? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox or his, his ass, his donkeys, or your neighbor's what? Wife. Well, if you had the neighbor's wife, then he can't have the wife. Coveting and envying is reaching the place where you wish they didn't have it. And you had it instead. It's not bad if they have a nice car. You say, wow, that'd be, that'd be fun to have a nice car like that. Is it wrong to say, I like to have a nice Or for, the, for them to go to a nice college, you say, wow, I hope someday my kids can go to that college. It's not a bad thing to, to say. It's when you wish you had it and they didn't. Where you say, I'm not satisfied with what I have. Therefore, they have more than I have. So he starts out this way. He envies the wicked. But he doesn't stop there. The second thing he does, he progresses by comparing himself to other people. As soon as you start to envy what they have, now you start to set up a comparison. They have it. I don't. They have more money. I don't. They have a nicer home. I don't. They have blah, 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 a nice job, and I don't. They get on good vacations, and I don't. And they're smart, and I'm... And before you know it, you, you think, God, God can't be good. I don't have all the things that they have. That's the second mistake he makes. Starts out by envying, progresses by comparing. Thirdly, he continues by regretting regretting his walk with the Lord he says you know I'm wasting my time surely in vain I've done all these things what a waste of time but he didn't start out by regretting let me give you the verses that this is built on verse 1 surely God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart but as for me my feet had almost slipped I had nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Have you been there? Look, he says, envying. It just blocks out what God wants to do. He goes on in the text, verse 4. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens. Verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence from their callous hearts. Who is he looking at? Is he looking at God? Why do we come and worship? So we can focus on God. So we can see what God wants to do and how good God is to us. But our tendency is to come and say, wow, did you see the car they're driving? Oh, wow, did you see the... And before you know it, look, you're focusing not on God, but you're comparing yourself with others. Psalm 73, verse 12 says it this way. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. He looks at his life. He looks at their life. And what do we say he does? This is what he does. He's comparing. He's comparing. And that's built on top of envying. He starts out envying, and then he gets to comparing. Now you have problems. I want you to stop comparing yourself. God says it this way in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. 
I just highlighted that first part. We do not dare to do what? Compare ourselves. We can always find somebody that's worse than us. We can always find somebody that's better than us. And he says, he goes on in this text, we dare not to classify or compare ourselves with someone who compend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not what? Wise. So if you're not wise, what's the opposite of being wise? <laughs> Foolish. What do your kids learn to do in school all the time? As soon as they take a test and the, the test gets handed back out, what's everybody say to the other person? What'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? What are we teaching them in school right there? To compare. And God already said that's not wise. You know, probably the best, the best way to do it is to put it in an envelope and seal it up and say, get this to your parents. This is your test. And in this class, we're not going to let anybody compare grades. Then somebody that's struggling a little bit doesn't have to worry about it at all. And somebody that thinks they're the number one cock-a-doodle-doo <laughs> doesn't get a chance to do some more crowing. You know, I used to say to my kids, you know, I don't really care what you get for a grade. Now that, now, do you think my wife? <laughs> you know, what do you mean you don't care what they get for a grade? <laughs> I said, look, it doesn't matter to me what you get for grade. The question I'm going to ask you is this. Have you done your best? Because then they don't have to compare themselves with somebody else. They're just doing their best. If they haven't done their best, uh, when, if they get a C, I would have said to them, did you do your best? That's all that matters. God's asking us to give of our best to the master. Some of you, it's an A. Some of you, it's, it's a C. And God's not going, oh, what a dummy. <laughs> God is saying, you know, those are just grades and how, how you, actually that C ought to stand for compare. How you compare with everybody else. Somebody got an F and somebody got an A and here's how you C compare. And he says, if you do that, you're foolish. Some people, they, they, uh, you've seen them. They, they are outstanding students. But when you ask them to change a tire on a car, they can't do it. When, when you ask them how to boil an egg, they can't do it. And God is saying, look, don't make the same mistake that who made? Asaph. That who made? The chief musician, the worship leader of their congregation. He goes on, verses 13 and 14. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. This is the worship leader saying, what a waste of time. Can't believe I did all that. It was just in vain. I lived a godly life for nothing. Do you see it there? Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. I did all this and what did I get for it? And what's he do right here? He's regretting his service for God. And that's built on how he was comparing himself to others. And that was built on envying. And he made these mistakes. And don't you make those mistakes. Here's the entire 73rd Psalm. It's 28 verses. Let me just divide it into three sections, okay? And you can see how... When you open up God's word, you want to say, okay, what's going on here and how is it divided? And look at how in English we divide it. Verse 1, surely. Verse 13, surely. Verse 18, surely. And what he was saying is, he uses these words in the Hebrew. I'll show you that in a second. But these are just the same word in Hebrew. And sometimes in our, some translations, it's surely. Some translations, it's Really? Really? This r really is true. Sometimes it's truly, truly. And so he's saying, surely what? God is good. 
That's the first section. Surely God is good, but I look at all these other people and I go, wait a minute, God. The second section, surely I, I've been foolish. And then the third section, he says, ah, oh, now I understand. Remember what verse 16 and 17 said? When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. What's going to happen to the wicked? Surely the wicked will be what? Punished. Here is the uh, Hebrew text. Just uh, remember the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. The Old Testament, when you read Hebrew, it's, you read it from right to left, Rather than like ours, we read ours from left to right. When you look at this text, three times he uses this little bitty word. I'll put it up here. It looks like that. Three times. Verse 1, verse 13, and verse 18. And each time it's to start a new section of what he's going to talk about. In verses 21 and 22, he finally kind of reaches the, the apex of his complaints. And he says, When my heart was grieved... I was so grieved. I was living for God and I wasn't getting the blessing. I was living for God and the wicked were prospering. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered. He said, I, I, I became bitter. It grieved me and I became bitter. How could you do this, God? I work, they get the blessing. I work, they prosper. I purify my heart, they go out and have a party. And it doesn't seem like anything's changed. And Satan was saying to Asaph, come on, you think God's good? And he was questioning that. And so he says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. <laughs> When's the last time you had somebody to tell you that they were ignorant? <laughs> Most of the time, somebody's telling us, you moron. <laughs> You ignoramus. You. But he was saying, when I was this way and I became bitter and I became grieved, surely I didn't have all the, what? Facts. When someone's out to lunch, we say, you, you just don't know the whole story. You don't have all the facts. Let me tell you the, the facts. And when we tell the facts, they go, oh, that's what. And so here's what was going on. But what was, what was he ignorant about? He was ignorant about this, the goodness of God. Because verse 1 says, surely God is what? Good. Good to Israel. Good to those who have a pure heart. But then verses 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. It's all about, God, you're not good. They do this, and they do that, and they do this. And the focus, he became ignorant on the goodness of God. We say it this way, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Pastor Furman was in Kenya just recently, and when he was in the Lodwar area, uh, where we're looking to go next summer and, and drill another well for people, when he was in that area, he walked by the hut, some of the huts that you know, were just nothing and he saw some kids there and they said hi and he said hi he says God is good and you know what they said all the time all the time in Kenya and they and they reciprocated it back all the time and he said God is good just way out in no man's land they knew about God's goodness but they don't have a nice house like yours they don't have a warm shower like yours they don't have a nice stove and refrigerator with food like you do. But they know the goodness of God. Why don't we know it then? Well, God's good all the time. But there are four facts. Remember I said he was ignorant because he didn't have all the what? He had all the facts. So he says, look, there are, there are four facts that he reveals to us here in verses uh, 23 and 24. There are four facts that help you focus in on what was going on. You ever get a pair of glasses? And you, uh, I got a couple of pair of glasses. One uh, that's, that I wear, like this one I drive, and it's bi they're bifocals. You know, so the upper level, I can see you, and then when I go to read, uh, it comes into focus because this is different in the bottom than in the top. Then when I go to get in the computer, 
I look at these and these are, are good for this distance, book distance, or they're good for that distance, but they're not good for that uh, the hand length away on the on the computer screen. So I off one pair on the other pair. Then then I get to go. I get up to go someplace. Uh, there have been times I've jumped in the car and I, I look and I oh I got the wrong glasses on. Back in the house, grab the other glasses. You've done that. If if your eyes are as bad as mine, but you know maybe you have good eyes. Maybe I can envy your. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> He said, look, they're out of focus. They're out of focus. And if you get the facts, I can let you get the goodness of God back into focus. And so here's the first fact. Fact number one, God will be with us in our struggles. He never, he never says you won't have struggles, but he says you will never go through those struggles alone. Even when you cross through the waters, I'll be with you. Whatever you face, I'll be with you. And lo, I am with you how often? always, even to the end of the age. Here's the way he says it in verses 23 and 24. All the facts of Psalm 73 come from verses 23 and 24. The first fact is Asaph. Finally, you know, he's gone into the sanctuary of God in verses 16 and 17, and he says, okay, now I understand. Now I've seen it from God's point of view. Now God's turned it around 180 degrees. Now I know. Now God has put it in back into focus, and what do I see? I see that God is always with me in struggles. Here. Yet, I am always with you. And what's amazing about this is this isn't God speaking here. This is Asaph speaking. He's saying, God, I can't believe it. I, I'm always with you no matter where I go. And really, it, it's not so much that he's always with God, but God's always with him. And if God's always with him, we're always with God. And so he says, when you go to the battle, I'm there with you. When you're all by yourself, you're not alone. I'm there with you. I'm always with you. <clears throat> what kind of a job do you think this guy does? <laughs> you just look at the earpiece and kind of the stance and even the haircut and you say, You're probably a oh, secret service. Yeah, it's right it's right from the it's right from the uh website in the Justice Department. There's a picture of a Secret Service agent. <clears throat> I have a couple of, of good friends that are agents. Well, the, the Secret Service. One of them, uh, I, I got to know years ago when we lived in Indiana, and he lived right across the street. We became good friends. And when he finally met the gal that he wanted to marry, he said, hey, would you marry us? And I officiated at their, their wedding, and, and we had uh, great times together. We moved from Indiana out here. And they moved from Indiana out here. And we said, oh, great, maybe you'll live in the Antelope Valley with us and we'll have time to connect uh, again. They ended up living down in Santa Clarita because it needed to be closer. He was guarding at that time the Reagan detail. But Secret Service agents probably come the closest to this, what, to describe what this verse says. I am with you how often? Always. And when you're the President of the United States, there is never a time that Secret Service agents aren't right around the corner. They sleep at the president's house. If he has a house like in Crawford, Texas or other places like the former presidents have, they, they guard them after they're no longer president. The other guy, the, the guy I just told you about, his name was Carl Janish. And Carl would tell me, oh, you know, I was down in Mexico with the president the other day. And remember when he fell off the horse? Reagan fell off the horse? He was really seriously injured. But they didn't want it to get out to the public at that point because it was, you know, if something happens to the president in the world, okay, how about the vice president? You get things and you put them back in place. So once in a while he'd tell me little just kind of tidbits. Another guy was Bob Brown. And Bob lived here in the Antelope Valley and his 
son played soccer with our son. And, and so I said, oh, I have another friend that's an agent. And we became friends, and we've been over their house. And he said, oh, yeah, we were up at the Reagan Ranch. And he said, yeah, I had the chainsaw. Uh, president Reagan was out there with his chainsaw cutting wood. And, and these people just hang around the president. That's their job, just to go hunting with the president or uh, cutting wood with the president or just doing things. One of the things that Reagan put in his book, he, he, he tried to um, mess with the Secret Service, you know, because they, they're supposed to really be sharpshooters and they're willing to take a bullet any time. And Reagan used to be out on his ranch. He'd have, he had a little pond area and there would be frogs and snakes. And so he had a, he had a, like a 22. And he got there with a 22. Well, the 22, a little, little bitty bullet. And he'd look at that one of the snakes and bam, you know, and kill the snake. And the, these Secret Service agents are thinking, how did he hit that snake with a with a twenty-two? I mean, they got a big old gun and they can't, they couldn't even hit him. But what Reagan would do, instead of having a bullet, you can actually buy twenty-two, twenty-two shells that have little BBs. So there were multiple, and when they shot out, they would go into a little pattern. And it wasn't one little thing, but he had the 22, and so he'd pull it out, boom! And the Secret Service agents were going, wow! Because they're always with him, and he kind of smiled, and he never told him until he, came, <laughs> until he came out with his book that, you know, what he was doing so he could be better than the Secret Service agents. But the Secret Service agents were always what? Always there. Always present. Here's uh, exactly what happened when President Reagan was shot. They're always there, always ready to take a bullet. Here's another picture when Bush was uh, uh, attempting to do a press conference, really at the White House, and the, an agent had to jump in in a situation that occurred. Because they're always there. We don't have that problem. <laughs> we can go any place. We don't have to worry. But they're always there. The, my friend said, you know, when they'd get up in the morning, they, um, I mean, the presidents would wake up, and they would talk about different men they would guard. And the presidents uh, will get up, and their hair, the pillow head. You, you, uh, the president comes out in his bathrobe, and he'd say, hey, you boys want to read the newspaper? And he'd give them the paper from what he had gotten. They said about uh, Reagan, what you saw in public, but it's just how he was in private. Just an ordinary kind of guy. Care about people. Because they were always there to understand. I want you to understand, God is always there. What does he say in Matthew 28, 18 to 20? And lo, I am with you always. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Look, God is good all the time. But sometimes we get the facts skewed. And we can't really see the perspective. One, he's always with us. Secondly, he will hold us during our struggles. It's one thing to be with us. It's another thing to be held. When little kids are, uh, don't want to be alone at night, they know mom and dad's there. If mom and dad are there, that's good. But then if they have a bad dream, if they have a nightmare, and they call out to mom or dad, they want dad or mom to be with them and to just kind of hold them. You'll be okay. Nobody's here. You're not going to get hurt. Here's what the text says. Yet I'm with you always. You hold me by my right hand. You hold me. The, the Hebrew word means to just grasp. You grab on. You seize. You say. What's what, what you did as parents when you crossed the street with your kids. You said here. Hold my hand. Now they're safe. God says I'm going to hold you. You're going to be safe. Genesis 25, 26 uses the same Hebrew word to give you a kind of a picture. After this, this is Jacob and Esau's birth. Remember Esau came out first? And when Jacob came out, here's what it says. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. He said, wait a minute, we've been together for nine months. You're not going out without me. Just grab on, hang on, just hold. He's right there. God's right there and he's holding you. Let me give you another example of this. Um, this is Audrey and I with the two of our friends here in the Antelope Valley, uh, Joyce and Sandy Sanford. And Joyce and Sandy, we met them back 
in probably 87. And at that time, uh, their son, Chris, was involved with our five-day clubs. We started right out. Somebody came here doing five-day clubs, and Chris was uh, like uh, 16, 17-year-old at that time. Early January 1989, um, there was a shooting in the Alt Valley in Lancaster. The guy was driving around the neighborhood. He went to that house, and, his, and Chris was outside. The guy started shooting. Chris thought, I'll duck down He's, because the guy was shooting. He was just shooting a 22. But Chris got down really low, and the guy hit him. Jason Sandy called me. I was at the hospital with him. Uh, by the time, this was a Saturday night. You know, it's a, I'm thinking, okay, Sunday morning. This is Saturday night about 11 o'clock. About 3 o'clock, well, I was up all night. And just I, I think I got my shoes off for a little bit, and when I put them back on, they were still warm you know, for Sunday morning services. But when I was with Joyce and Sandy at the hospital, they said, you know, we thought uh, Chris, their son, was still alive. His body was still functioning. Uh, they'd been in to see him. I'd been in to, we'd prayed, we'd read scripture. We uh, took some hope with the very fact that they, what the guy had shot him with was a twenty-two. A twenty-two. Uh, when I was with the coroner's department, a guy wanted to kill himself, and he had a twenty-two. And he, so he took the twenty-two, put it up the right side of his head, pulled the trigger, and the bullet wouldn't even penetrate his skull. It hit the skull and ran over the top. He put himself in the front of the head, boom, didn't go through the skull, skull ran over the top of his head. So we were taking some encouragement that, oh, well, you know, he was hit by a twenty-two, you know, it, Certainly in the head, but, you know, he'll be okay. They didn't realize it, and I didn't realize it, and we hadn't been told by the doctor. We met with the doctor in the side room in the emergency area at Animal Valley Hospital, and finally he realized that, well, what, what's the prognosis? We're thinking, he says, he kind of looked at him, and he says, oh my goodness, haven't they told you? Your son is... is dead, brain dead. We're just keeping him alive to see if you want us to use any parts of his body. And here's what happened. The 22 went right through the eye, the softest part. Didn't hit the skull. Went right through the eye and right into the brain and killed him. At that point, when the doctor left, I was there with them, and, you know, Joyce and Sandy, they just, they just wanted to hold each other. It wasn't enough just to be there with them. And words aren't going to say anything. At that point, what do they need? Just do what? Hold. Just hold me. If you guys really, if you guys want to really learn something that takes most guys uh, about 50 years of marriage to learn, usually don't say anything. Just, just hold them. God said, look, I, he is good. And he's going to what? He's going to hold us. He's going to hold us. God's good all the time. And if we get the facts right... The first fact, he's with us in our struggle. The second fact is he'll hold us. He's not going to let us go. He said it this way, you're in Jesus' hand, John 10. And Jesus is in the Father's hand. And nobody can take you out. I'm going to hold you right there. Isn't that good to know? Let me give you the third fact. God will guide us through our struggles. These are all little nuances of what you want in the midst of struggles. He'll be with you. Sometimes that's not enough. Hold me. Then sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes it's, hey, can you tell me, Lord, what should I do with our kids in this? Lord, how should I handle my wife in this? Lord, how should I handle my job in this? Whatever the struggle is, Lord, now that with the cancer's there, what do we do? And my brother uh, called uh, a week ago, 
he had cancer in 2002 when, did, when my mom died, and, and he had eight months of treatment, and it was in remission. He called two weeks ago, and he said, you know, the cancer's back. He's 64. And so last this week, this past few days, he started treatments all over again. You know, you want God to guide you at that point. Here's the text again. Verse 23, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. It's great that God doesn't leave us to our own devices. He tells us how to live. He guides us. You know, we have seeing eye dogs. Guide dogs, we call them. They help people that are what? Blind. God says there are times that we're blind to God's goodness. Then he saved us and we go, wow. He opened the eyes of our hearts. We even sing songs. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. God says, look, I'll, I'll guide you. I'll give you directions. He guides us with his word. The word's a lamp to my feet, light to my path. I'll guide you. When he says uh, to uh, women, have nothing to do with an angry man, lest you learn his ways and be like him. Is that hard to understand? Is, he, is it complicated? No, he just kind of tells you. Don't have anything to do with an angry man. But what's the woman say? Oh, he'll change for me. And he gives you these warnings. Let me uh, read you this little story. See the box on the screen with fragile? Uh, Alexander Miller said, I took a journey through northern India by rail. It was a trip of a lifetime. I had never forgotten the sights of that journey. One afternoon, we had stopped at an obscure little rail station. As the workers went about their labors, I saw them unload a large crate marked fragile. It also said, this case must be carried bottom up. Below that notice was a second notice. It said, to avoid confusion, the top has been labeled bottom. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, is it now the bottom or... Has it, do I need to make that the bottom? Or, he looked and he thought, that's not clear. But God will guide you and he'll do it in a very clear way. Look. Exodus 13, 21. By day the Lord went ahead of them in, the, in a pillar of cloud to do what? To guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could go by day or by night. If God was willing to do that in the Old Testament for people, now he gives us his word. Now he gives us his Holy Spirit to live in us. But man, God is good. He's going to guide us. Look, God is good all the time. And here are the facts. He's with us through our struggles. He's, he holds us during our struggles. He'll guide us through our struggles. And the last fact... God will eventually take us out of our struggles. You say, oh, really? I, didn't, I don't read that in God's word that we'll, we can just trust Jesus and there'll be no struggles in life. I, I didn't say in life. I said God will eventually take us out of struggles and here's how the psalmist says it in verse 24. 23, 24, yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will take me into where? <laughs> Glory. Your struggle is going to eventually end. God says, I love you enough that I'm not going to let you to be, I'm not going to let you live to be 150 years old. You know, you could be like Methuselah. I, I say, God is really good not to let us live. 969 years old? Can you imagine what you feel like at 50? <laughs> Just think, double that, and then triple that, and then 
isn't God good to take us out of here? He said, I'll take you out. Same Hebrew word is used uh, uh, to describe Enoch in Genesis 5.24 where it says this, Enoch walked with God. And then he was no more because God took him away. That's why we need to reach the place where we say, oh, even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come. Take me away. Do you know all the facts? God wants to change your life so you know his goodness. He's not going to take, he didn't take Daniel out of the lion's den. But he was with him. He would hold him. He would guide him as what to do. And he took him out. He didn't take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fiery furnace. But he was with them. And there was a fourth person in the furnace. God doesn't say he's going to take the struggles away. He says, look, why do I, why do I preach on Psalm 73 today? This is Thanksgiving weekend. We need to learn about the goodness of God. And Satan wants you to think that God's not good. But he's good. God is good all the time. And the question I have for you is, have you thanked God for his goodness? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. For being with us, for guiding us, for holding us, and for the hope, that blessed hope that you're going to take us to be with you. Where there will be no more night and you'll wipe away all tears. And death will be no more. Can you tell God right now that you want to thank him for the goodness he's given you? Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.